Welcome back to, I don't even know what episode, but I think we're in double digits of Super oh, yeah. Politics. Oh, it's uh, it's episode, I think, 11 at this point. Wow. Honestly. Uh, this is too much work. <laughs> I'm tired. Bye. <laughs> but yeah, see you later. We have a really awesome uh, episode today. We're excited. We have Nathan Robinson coming on. And if you've been kind of following the democratic socialist movement at all, uh, you probably might have heard his name. He is the editor of a magazine called Current Affairs, which is hilarious and and really intelligent magazine. He is also the author of a book that you can see behind Decatur there called Why You Should Be a Socialist. And um, I will just say that, you know, in my kind of political journey, this was a really important book to me to help me, you know, as I mentioned on the show before, I used to be, you know, right wing libertarian. And my kind of central kind of ethos was I believe humans should be free. And this was one of the books that kind of first, I almost reluctantly read it like, ah, let's see what he has to say. But you know, this idea that I think is really mind blowing to me about people like Nathan Robinson is they believe as do I now, is that socialists are actually the ones genuinely interested, not just in freedom as a theory, but as a practice as well. That how do we, how do we build a society where people are truly free, not just from their government, but also in kind of all aspects of life? Right. I think it's like, it's kind of, this book really did a really great job for me kind of pointing out the liberty that you can have under socialism. And so I think that's, that's a really important thing. I'm really happy we have him on. I'd like to point out actually, Steve got me this book after he read it. He loved it so much. And in it, it was a, it was a birthday uh, gift. And he said, happy birthday. And then he wrote, uh, you guys. Oh like, my God. Oh, I can see it. Death to Noam Chomsky. And I want to point out <laughs> that the person who had to write that, who was like, you know, a big Bernie crat, was very confused when the book was picked up like why would this man tell me to write death to noam chomsky kind of surprised he did (laughs) he was offended or just surprised uh just a couple of i was gonna call it like you know housekeeping i don't like when people say that well hold on are you gonna tell people why i wrote that or just make me seem like a dick uh i mean now i don't remember i thought you wrote I wrote it. You remember Noam Chomsky was being canceled at the moment. Now, Noam Chomsky, oh! not every, yeah, not all of our listeners know, but Noam Chomsky, uh, a lot of you, of course, do, and, and many of you won't. And Noam Chomsky is a very influential thinker on the left. And, uh, of course, he is uh, very, um, very much about kind of libertarian he, socialism. He talks like this. He always says he talks like this. He's like a very famous person, but he kind of talks like he's drinking a lot of codeine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he's obviously a genius. And uh, Decatur was super sad when he was being canceled. He had signed on to this letter about the Harper, you know, the Harper, the Harper letter. letter, right? Which is famous to many. And to those who don't know what that is, there was a kind of famous letter that came out a few months ago um, that was signed by a lot of influential people. Um, I, basically saying cancel, cancel culture has kind of gone too far. <laughs> um, there, there's some really good critiques of the letter that I've heard. Um, but the, the point is, is Noam Chomsky wrote onto it. It was written in a vague enough way where it could kind of get anyone's signature. It's like, oh, we should encourage free speech. It's like, well, right. yeah. You know, but what's the context of that? You know, are we talking about, you know, free speech to be hateful? Or are we talking about, you know, anyway, listen to our last episode if you want to hear more about free speech. But my, my point here is Decatur was really bummed out because he's like, how can you cancel Noam Chomsky? He's like one of the biggest heroes for the left that have, has, he's dedicated his whole life to the left and, and to trying to improve our society. And now he signs a letter that J.K. Rowling happened to sign as well. And now he's like, we're canceling him. And, uh, and so knowing how sad he was about it, I wrote that note uh, for his birthday, <laughs> Death to Noam Chomsky, just as a pick-me-up. Although, of course, we, we both love Noam Chomsky, so there's right. just a joke. And I mean, like, let's be honest, there's no way to really give anyone a pick-me-up in 2020. Mm. It's pretty dark. Yeah, all, all humor is dark at this point. So um, we're going to bring Nathan on, uh, Nathan Robinson on in just a second here. Um, but you were going to bring up some housekeeping. Yeah, like I said, I, I kind of regret I used the phrase housekeeping at times. No, it's okay. I'm but, just uh, imagining you dressed up like a housemaid, and, and that helps me get through this. <laughs> <laughs> Do housemaids wear chokers, or is that just sort of a thing in, like, that's just in the, That's just in the porn you watch. <laughs> <laughs> that's not real life. Okay, you're right. Good. But just, guys, everyone, 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 uh, subscribe to our Patreon. And... <laughs> I thought you were going to say go vote. <laughs> no. 
Okay, if you don't Listen. have time to vote, we understand, but you do have time to get on our Patreon. <laughs> I'll tell you what. Uh, does our Patreon require a state ID and a mailing address? No, no, it doesn't. We literally don't care where you get the money from or who you are. Just give it to us. You know, there's a lot of really, really great questions about misconceptions about socialism, especially about democratic socialism. What is it? You know, is it the same thing as uh, Marxism? Is it the same thing as what Stalin did to Russia? You know, is it what? Right. What are we? What are we talking about here? Now, what Nathan Robinson is going to come on and talk about is just one perspective on socialism, which is uh, this more libertarian socialism of basically it's an anti-authoritarian viewpoint where no, we're not down for Stalinism. Where I'm not trying right. to create a red army that will then you know march through the streets and kill people who disagree with our political ideology like that's just right. not not to say that that's exactly per se you know an accurate description of history but just that's what everyone's conception of what happened in russia was that's of course not what bernie sanders is trying to do and not what decatur and i are trying to do and certainly not what nathan robinson is trying to do and in fact oh. they the libertarian socialists have been some of the most staunch critics of those systems in history and um and you know so we're going to answer a lot of questions about that and what i what i hope to do with this episode um i don't I, of course, we want you to just believe whatever we tell you. But second, if, if that doesn't work for you, then at, at a minimum, we get you thinking about these ideas, because I think the project that I think and I hope that all of our listeners agree with us on, even if not our specific political ideology, is we're trying to build a better world. And there's definitely some really tough questions that need to be asked about our society right, right. now, because there's so much poverty and suffering. Yeah, I, I think. In, and that's something that really he points out in, in this book really well that everyone should go pick up and read. And I'm sure you're all going to pick it up after you watch the interview, because not only only you're going to be like, wow, it was a great interview. You're like, wow, those interviewers were like really talented and great at what they do. <laughs> but I, I think that what's really important is the left doesn't lose sight at building a better society and a utopia for some. And I, you know, it's become kind of like this cliche, dirty word, almost say utopia as long as, as lo like socialism is a dirty word. I but almost I fell think, out of my chair. How can you talk about utopia? Yeah, right. Exactly. But oh so I, I, I do think, you know, it's important to look at, what we say is far-fetched and what we realize reality is now, right? With like healthcare, uh, housing, capitalism, jobs, wages, all these things. We say like, oh, well, you guys are asking for things that could never happen. Well, what is happening right now is not really what we think you know, ideally is supposed to happen either. You know what I mean? It's like, we're so far removed from even capitalism working where, you know, I think that it's important to ask ourselves these questions about what can, what can the future hold. Yeah, so we hope you enjoy this interview. We thought, you know, it's it's far past time that we do an episode on socialism and, you know, to... The, to do it justice, we were just so lucky to have Nathan Robinson come on and uh, and just kind of champion this cause for us because he's been, you know, he's just very, very well educated in it. And, you know, that's not to say, of course, like you'll you'll hear a lot about he'll mention that he doesn't consider himself a Marxist. You know, so right. there are some distinctions and, and, and I don't want anyone to get bogged down in these terms. What is a libertarian socialist? What is a Marxist? You know, honestly, the, the, the better the better approach, um, which you'll hear Robinson talk about a bit here, is we're, we're trying to have an outlook. Right. It's about like sh we shouldn't we shouldn't really settle for a system where there is so much poverty, where there is so much like lack of, of uh, liberty in your own workplace, in your own life, you know, and where you're, you might, it might, you might have a, the whims of a boss is what decides whether or not you get healthcare, for example, right? right. Like th right. these, these injustices that exist in our society, if we can at least start by agreeing that they're unnecessary, right? And now I think a lot of people do think like, well, that's just how it is. It's the best we can do. But uh, I want you to, to second guess that when you're listening to this, because, and this is something that I think is really important. There are people who stand to make a lot of money by you choosing to accept the idea that this is the best we can do. It is the right. same argument I imagine any king made during monarchy and feudalism. It's the same argument that a slave master would make uh, in a slavery system. It's the same argument that right. people in power have made throughout history. And we're just in another system with a huge power dynamic where the people on top are trying to convince you not to question it. And so that's kind of what the, the, where I want to take this from. So we're going to talk about socialism, particularly democratic socialism or libertarian socialism and uh, get Nathan on here in a minute. Listen to the interview, like, and subscribe. Yeah.
We're going to put the video of this up on our Patreon. And, uh, I keep uh, forgetting. I keep forgetting this is on video now. I should stop making dumb faces. Oh, yeah. yeah no, you can't help your face. But the, the it's it's where it is. It's a lost know. cause. <laughs> it's a lost cause. Like, you can do I blame it. capitalism personally. Oh, yeah. Me too. Me too. Yeah, exactly. For your face? Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Hey, thanks hey. for doing this. Yeah, yeah, thank you. It's so nice to be with you both. Yeah, yeah. No, we're both uh, definitely big fans and uh, um, have your book, <laughs> as you can see. I, yeah. I can see that right there. Yeah, I realize it kind of looks like, like I'm promoting like a book I wrote. It looks a little weird. But... <laughs> oh, I, I'm all in favor of that. Are you in Las Vegas as well? Yeah, yeah. We're both oh, in Vegas. Oh, okay. Yeah. Huh. I, yeah. I don't know anyone in Las Vegas. The Las yeah. Vegas people I've met. I didn't yeah, know yeah. there were normal people in Las Vegas. No, there's not. It's all it's all just uh, blackjack dealers and and, and strippers and That's you know. Crazy. Which we've been lying. I, That's actually what we do. Yeah. I just I make assumptions. There are stereotypes. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. Well, there's stereotypes. You're in New Orleans, right? The, the... Yes, all the stereotypes about New Orleans are true. Yeah, I just yeah, 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 of, of course. Are true as well. <laughs> of course, of course. So, yeah, no, it's, uh, I find them to kind of be kindred cities in a way because of all the debauchery that goes on in each. So, yes, but no, but uh, yeah, ours is good debauchery, though. Yeah. Really? Yeah, <laughs> right. We don't do, I mean, we have one big casino, but like, you know, there's a lot of jazz, there's a lot of parades and dancing. Right. You know, right. We don't have like a giant institution dedicated to sucking money. I mean, we suck money out of the tourists, but like something could disturbing about the casino. Oh, well, they, they, you're, at thing. least in your model, they give some experience back that isn't just like the dopamine release of gambling. That's all we give. Yes. That's all we offer, yes. right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, We're, and like, you know, I, some magic shows. I guess. Yeah, right, right, right. Well, they, I mean, what's amazing about this, not to go on too much of a tangent, but is that Vegas's model for shows is we'll take uh, like Broadway shows and bring them to Vegas, but we'll literally cut the time in half. Like a three-hour show will be an hour and a half here because we hmm. want you back on the casino floor. Huh. Like, it's, it's just all, it's everything is just yeah. it's, it's less wow. about culture and more about just slot yeah. machines and They've cigarettes. They've really got really, it down to a right. science, haven't they? Um, so just to like kick things off a little bit, uh, we both kind of pulled a bunch of our friends who have different ideologies. And of course, your book goes through a lot of the questions too about socialism. It's a really dirty word, right? Yeah. And so yeah. uh, it's the boogeyman here. And uh you know, we want to ask you, you know, put some of those questions to you. Um, oh God. We're both aware of your answers because we've read your book, which right. is fantastic. Yeah. So let's, let's kind of just jump into it. So why should you be a socialist? That's not the question. That's the name of your book. Um, but the first yeah. question, you know, people don't know what socialism means, of course. Right. Um, the, so one of the first questions is like, really, what, what is democratic socialism? I, I guess that's kind of just a broad yeah. question. I'll let you answer it how you want. Well, so people think of, when people think of socialism, uh, a lot of the conservative attempt to define socialism is to associate socialism with government power and authority, right? And, and their kind of picture of it that they want to draw for you, the very simple picture, the one that the, kind of, the libertarians draw, is like there's, there's the government slash the public sector, and then there's the private market. And socialism is about concentrating uh, the, the power in a centralized government bureaucracy. Capitalism is about letting the individual in the free private market make economic decisions. And this is kind of what, this is a very, very simplistic framework, but it's, it's sort of exactly the libertarian yes. framework, right? right. Um, I, I think every libertarian presents it kind of that way. Yeah. I think it's a bad way to think. First off, the first way we know that that's not true is because under that definition, a monarchy would be socialist, right? Like an right. all powerful monarchy, because you just concentrate power in the king and then right. the king would own everything. Um, and then he'd be a socialist because it's government power. This is also why people say like the Nazis are socialists because they're a very powerful government. This is literally right. like the yeah. argument that conservatives right, right. make. They go, well, the Nazis are a powerful government, therefore they're socialists. But wait, <laughs> if, a, if this would make a king socialist, that's a little weird, right? Because it, it right. seems like most socialists are anti-monarchy. So, right. so what, 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 how would socialists define it? Well, socialists start less with government, private, public, and more with class right? They start with class and they start with ownership. They start with who owns what and they start with what are the you know, Marxist terms, like the social relationships between people. 
And of course, the fundamental socialist conception of the world is that there are a bunch of people who have to work for their living. And there are some people who are capitalists and they own stuff, which means that they, I mean, some of them work, but when you are a capitalist, <laughs> you have, when you have control over capital, other people have to sell their labor to you and, uh, and, and you get to live off of profit and off of uh, passive income. Um, right. And so the socialists start with an opposition to, and I, I talk about it in the book, the way a lot of us begin is with looking at grotesque inequality, looking at the fact that some people have vastly more money and power than other people. And, and that some people have, and that people have different roles and there is a sort of hierarchy. There are people at the top and the people at the top, you know, capitalism is best understood as a system of private hierarchy where the person at right. the, the boss gives the instructions and the worker has to follow them or be fired. Um, and this is kind of where most socialists start, right? If you look through socialist rhetoric for hundreds of years, it really, really begins with thinking about, it focuses a lot on the work place and it focuses a lot on the relationships between the people who give the orders and the people who take the orders now right. one the, the reason that socialism has sort of become associated with uh, government is partly because i think that a lot of socialists kind of made um a big mistake which is that they looked at this system and and this is my dispute with marxism which is why i'm not a marxist socialist and they thought well you know clearly the problem is private property it's that it, some people own the things and the other people don't have the private property. So we need to abolish private property. We need to distribute, uh, we need to own property in common. The problem is that, I, that my problem with Marxists is that it, it, it lacks an, an understanding of the fact that hierarchy was kind of the source of the problem, right? And what you can do, what you can end up doing, and I think where a lot of communist socialist states have gone uh, wrong and why we, ha why we need to emphasize that we are democratic socialists to get to the other part of your question, um, is that they've concentrated power in the state just in the way that libertarians critique. Um, and what happens is you have a new class of people who own and control, um, but you haven't fixed the fundamental problem that there are a small number of people giving the orders and a much larger number of people taking the orders. So right. I think democratic socialists, and I call myself a libertarian socialist, which I think synthesizes uh, a lot of the good analysis of, of socialism and the good points of libertarianism, right? Because right. libertarian has a good critique of centralized government. Um, um, to say, well, the, what we really, really need is we need to figure out ways to democratize our economic structures. And we need to think less about this public-private thing, you know, is, is this the public sector or the private sector? And more, regardless of which sector it is, do we have democratic input into the decisions that affect people? So that democracy is getting to participate in the decisions that affect your lives, then a worker co-op is operating according to that principle of democracy, right? Because the people on the shop floor get to make decisions, um, but also a democratic government in which people get to not only vote, but vote in a meaningful way where they're not manipulated by, you know, very, very, very powerful uh, people putting out propaganda. Um, that is also embodying a socialist principle. So I, I talk about socialism as a kind of set of democratic principles that you use to analyze your institutions. So if your economic uh, institutions aren't democratic, um, then they're not in conformance with the, the fundamental socialist ideal. And the same is true with, with, your, your, with the political sphere, with the government. Um, right. So that's kind of where I begin to think about it. I think uh, that actually, that helps debunk too. Uh, when we were polling people, just kind of trying to find out where people were, someone did point out that you can't spell socialist without CIA. So I think that you pointing out the, uh, <laughs> getting rid of the, that's of, you know, said? yes, yes. That's, uh, that's the average American for you. That's, that's yeah. where we're at. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's how we <laughs> get a Biden versus that? What does that mean? You know, it's very cryptic. Uh, I'll say I know a lot of Immortal Technique fans, if you know who that is, they all go through their conspiracy theory worlds. And I think that's just kind of where it ends up. <laughs> So. I have been accused of being CIA before. It's so fascinating. <laughs> Gee, they, well, that kind now, of now there's some validity to the claim. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I think that's exactly the perception that I always had. And, and just to even share like my own former libertarian views um, mm. is just that there's a sense of like futility, of course, right? Like socialism, this sounds like this idealistic, you know, plan that of course who wouldn't agree with everyone not being in poverty but you know as jesus said the, the poor will always be with us and and so a project like socialism is futile and the free yeah. market is the best we can do 
right? The free market and the employer employee right. relationship is the best we can offer. And so once you try to impose equality on people, right, right. which isn't what you're saying, but you know, just going yeah. back to the libertarian, yeah. idea, um, you know, that, that, that I think is kind of the most cut to the chase is like socialism yeah. can't work. And pr give me an example yes. of where it has. Well, yes. And, and I think I would dispute, you, you know, the, the even the use of the word, how does it work? Because right. I, uh, it is true that socialism for a long time was sort of discussed as, a, as an economic system. But I don't necessarily think that's the best way to think about it. Because I think that the task that socialists set themselves is actually thinking, well, how do we create an economic system that conforms to these principles? So you have, you, it's more like you have a spectrum. You have a spectrum of different societies that, that embody more or less the kinds of aspirations that you have. And so if you think of it that way, then you get to, okay, well, there are institutions that embody socialist principles that clearly work, right? So like the fire department, which is like a collectively owned and, and democratically controlled institution that right. serves everyone equally and is free at the point of use. So it doesn't discriminate on based on how much money you have. Right. Um, it is a socialized service because everyone has it in common. That works very well. So we're talking about uh, operating medicine and healthcare on the same kind of model, which they do successfully in several other countries, including Britain, where I'm from. Um, and so then you say, okay, well, a socialized institution, a collectively owned and run democratically supervised institution, well, that can work. Now, it is an open question how far you can take that principle. And I think there are, there's a lot of debate even among socialists because there are what are called market socialists. And market right. socialists believe that you do need the, uh, the incentives of, of the market to some degree, um, and, but that you are still trying to deconcentrate ownership. Um, and so there are a lot of open questions. And I think to see socialism as like a rigid prescribed system is something we kind of want to get away from and challenge. Right. And I think that you actually bring that up well in the book too. I think it's, you, you're talking about like how libraries, for example, it's like, mm. you know, there's not really any, you know, economic gain, but we should be having, you know, these, these sort of things. And I think that's a really good yeah. angle to take. Um, I'm, I'm kind of curious if you think that what, what your personal cutoff is as far as like, Social sort of like like I've noticed there's a bigger push for like universal housing and things like that, and yeah. I'm wondering if you think that is that even something that we should be pushing in America if like or if that's just too far fetched. Well, I think a a guaranteed right to housing is not far fetched um, because it's th these are that falls into the category of things that is. Um, uh, whatever the opposite of easier said than done is easier right. done than even argued about right, right. because right. literally you know you, you have a you have a state the state can build houses the state can give houses to the people who do not have houses um it it is it, it is now how m how many resources you have available um that's that's an open question right, right. um how you're going to maintain and how you're going to supervise these but we have public housing and the problem with public housing has not been there's been an attempt to portray like public housing as inherently it has to be a failure right, right. because you know because so much public housing has been has been terrible um but you know you could equally well conclude and i think the correct conclusion is that public housing fails when you don't care enough about the people in it to make sure that it's good right. um and if you do that uh, if you care about it if you care about having making sure that you have have really strong standards and that you're giving people good housing um there's no reason you can't have a basic right to housing um right. now you know whether you whether that is a basic right and then on top of that you just have uh market mechanisms operating which is you, you know it's it's often dis it's it's called social democracy right where you where you have like the basics guaranteed you have your floor below which nobody can can sink and then you on top of that just operate what you call capitalism right. um but the floor seems perfectly possible Right. It sounds like um, one of the things that was most persuasive to me, especially about libertarian socialism, is that mm. my priority has always been kind of just I want more freedom over my own life. And yeah. that, that's exactly what's so persuasive about this, uh, you know, kind of mm. ideology is that we're talking about, oh, well, how free are you at work? How free are you 40 hours or yeah. more a week? 
right? And so right. that's really persuasive to me. But if our goal is freedom, I, I got a really good question from my cousin the other day, who's not a socialist, and she posed the question about her father's independent business he runs it's just himself and his wife and yeah. it's it's becoming more and more successful if we kind of had a system where yeah. i don't know if the idea would be to impose worker cooperatives on everybody or you know yeah. eventually I, I i'm not exactly sure how that works but you mentioned worker cooperatives which to our yeah. listeners who don't know is a system where everyone has kind of a vote you're kind of an equal partner no matter what your role in the company is you have a say yeah. over what the company does and in fact that, that would include salary you have a, a say in that the salaries ideally would be more yeah. equalized if not flattened um and so her concern was well if you wanted to hire an employee and then you'd have to get up give up part of you know, control over this thing that he worked so hard to build, this company. Yeah, I mean, so uh, let me just make one po uh, point on, on freedom because I think I think um, this this is completely right. Um, the I just wanted to note that the socialists in the United States historically have been some of the greatest champions for individual liberty and freedom. Right. So like the socialists have been anti-war, which is, you know, government coercion. Right. They of the of the most naked and open type. The socialists have been the civil libertarians. Right. The people trying to you know, fighting for free speech have been in this country. The people like Eugene Debs, the socialists in the ACLU. Um, so, you know, we have a very noble tradition of fighting for individual and as you say at the workplace you, you know you are you're not free one of the things that i always bring up with debates in libertarian with the libertarians that really they get makes them very uncomfortable is you ask them okay well um should an employer be able to fire some uh, a woman if she gets pregnant um and they go well you know freedom freedom of contract and you go yeah but you know are is is she free to right get pregnant without being <laughs> fired and you go to, well, no, her employer right. is free to fire her. And you go, well, that's <laughs> yeah. freedom for one person. And the same is right. true with the libertarian approach to civil rights, where it's like the, the, the store owner has the freedom to discriminate, but I, the person being discriminated against, I do not have the freedom to go to any store I want. So there's right. a very selective attention to whose freedom matters. And oftentimes it's not yours. It's someone else's freedom. Anyway, so on the on the subject of yeah, do we all have to have work record? I have to say, um, I I will say, I so I founded Current Affairs, uh, me and, and another guy, Orin and me, um, and I gave up control completely, right? I, I don't own Current Affairs. I founded Current Affairs, started Current Affairs, and I wanted to turn Current Affairs as quickly as possible into a democratic organization. Um, I didn't want. I didn't feel like I personally, had, you know, other people are doing the work as well. Um, part of working in a in a team is having to give other people some input. Um, I, I shouldn't get to be the dictator of current affairs unless I'm the only one in. The way I get to be the dictator of current affairs is if current affairs is just me. <laughs> but if I hire people and they start doing work, right, um, they deserve to have some kind of say. I shouldn't be, you know, I shouldn't be able to say, well, I earn twice as much as you because I'm the dictator of current affairs because I started current affairs. Mm -hmm. You know, well, I, I, so I don't quite buy, even if you don't officially structure it as a cooperative, I think democratic principles and anti-hierarchical principles where you want people to feel not like they're being given orders but now you've got to select your employees carefully right because i think the the, the fear is well i'll i'll pick someone who you, you know i can't trust or who betrays me uh, and so you you've mm -hmm. got to make sure that the people who you bring into your team are the kinds of people that you want to work with whose input you do value um who you want as, as decision-making partners. And that, that may be a different kind of process than it would be if you were just hiring someone and your basic consideration is, well, can they do this small repetitive task that is the thing I want them for? It does put more of a burden on you to think, no, I'm bringing someone into this. They are not, it's not just going to be me pointing at them and going, go do this. Um, okay. So I, I, you know, I think the way that in practice most socialist proposals for how to restructure companies would work is that they get more 
restrictive as the company gets larger, right? So the companies over 250 employees have to have X number of employees on the board and a small company that's like five people, you know, basically we don't really pay any attention to how that works um, mm-hmm. except that there are minimum wages and we have general principles of like, don't abuse people, but you can <laughs> kind of do, do what you want other than that. Um, right. So I would say first that it's very unlikely that in a democratic socialist system again i don't use the word system but you know um that in a more democratic socialist economy there would be much coercion of how to run your company if you're very small um but i would also say that i would encourage people even who run small companies we have three full-time employees um to think you know how can this be something that is that is fair rather than something that is uh that is hierarchical do i really deserve to be you know to have c- complete control over over other people just because this institution was started by me mm-hmm. yeah i think that's kind of a good uh, jumping off point too one of the kind of things that some of the listeners have gotten and just arguments that I've seen online a lot, mainly from kind of like a new wave of people kind of curious about politics a lot, Mm. probably because like Andrew Yang and things like that is what does socialism look like under automation? Because I mean, that is going to take a lot of like, when if you start a company, you're not going to need as many employees, you know, and like, how does like socialism really fall under a world where eventually, you know, automation is going to be doing all the jobs? Yeah. No, I think, um, I, I, yeah, I, I, I try to avoid, uh, the reason I hesitate to answer your question is because again, you say, you know, what does socialism look like? Right. And this is, I, I try and give us all the answers, giving like <laughs> very clear vision. But what I can say is that the, the kind of socialist idea, uh, of like every single person needs to be taken care of and needs to be free, um, is one of the reasons why if you have, brutal laissez-faire capitalism as automation starts throwing people out of work you've got a really really unjust and cruel society because the thing about the thing about pure capitalism is supposedly it rewards people according to their productivity uh, how much they can how valuable their labor is well if if your labor isn't very valuable because you're not needed then you get you get nothing you're 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 shit out of luck you know you're you're you don't you don't get anything and this is one reason that capitalism is very unfair because like the people who are sick and disabled and old um obviously don't have market value uh mm-hmm. to their to their labor and so um you know capitalism is very cruel to them which is why we need social programs um but it's going to be true of out, out of work people under an automated system. So, you know, I, Andrew Yang does not describe himself uh, as, as a socialist, but universal basic income, a generous universal basic income, at least something that's designed to be more than a pittance um, is, you know, it is a collective program. It is a collective universal program of the kind that I think is necessary. Certainly not a pure free market cap. I mean, even though, you know, Milton Friedman advocated the negative income tax and whatever. Um, but to have, but to have the state basically, you know, giving out large sums of money sounds, to every yeah. person without them doing any work for it does violate a number of the uh, of the of the principles of pure capitalist distribution. But I think is absolutely going to be necessary as you see, <laughs> as you see people not have market value. But it's all it's necessary already, right? Because. Already it is the case that a lot of the things people do that are socially valuable don't have market value. And there's a conflation of those two things when those two things aren't, aren't identical at all. Yeah, I think this year is the perfect example. Obviously, you know, much ink has been spilled over that. But, the, you know, people who never before has been in a position where they can't, you know, be valuable to the market. Now they are experiencing that for the first time and questioning, hopefully questioning this system that we live in. Wait wait a second. I don't have a right to live unless I can work, you know, and like, I don't have a right to all sorts of things, housing, everything, you know, everything we're seeing right now. And I, it's just, to me, it's a fundamental, you know, it's kind of like checkmate to capitalism. It's like, well, now that you, you know, even Republicans are passing bills where we're handing out money to everybody. Isn't that kind of an indictment when they have to go against their own ideology in an emergency and the emergency really is only an exaggerated form of what we always lived through. There's always a situation where there's tons yes. of people who can't work, yes. right? And so it's just, more, it's just more obvious to more people now, right? So that's it. it's, it's an indictment on the system, I think. One guy, I said, I'm going to interview, and I said, I'm going to interview a gentleman who's a socialist. And he said, okay. does he live in his parents' basement? 
So do I you do not? My parents <laughs> live in Florida. They don't have a basement. Let's say you, you have, it like you have a full window behind you. Basement. I live in the no French window. Quarter of New Orleans. <laughs> a lovely apartment with a balcony yes. overlooking the Mississippi River. Thank you very much. Wow. I have an income. Oh, actually, this is kind of a trump card that I have because a lot of um, a lot of the criticism I've seen this before on online is people going like. Um, well, you, you socialists, you know, you criticize business and capitalism, but you couldn't run a taco truck, right? Or like you couldn't, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. And I actually am in the great position of being able to say, actually, excuse me, I have built a business from scratch, right? right. right? I, I have like, I've actually done, you know, I'm, I'm, it's not a, it's not for profit, but um, it's, uh, it, 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 it operates, I built an institution that makes money and sustains itself in the free market so right. you know I, I you know or they say like uh you know a socialist has never met a payroll never had to never you know never had to make i i've done that right so yeah, right, uh, right. of course so no course. i don't live in my uh, in my parents basement um I did live <laughs> in my parents for a couple of months during the pandemic but um but but also but also okay you know i i gotta say Fuck those people who say that because, because, because like, you don't understand, like, if you, have you seen the rates of young people living with their parents? I think it's like over half now. It's and the first, go, it's the highest since I read 1900 of, of, of people in their twenties living with their parents in over in think, 120 years. It's just, they all of a sudden, they all lost their, their work ethic. Well, no, people are working more than, you know, people's right. work hours, they, they're working a ton. Um, they can't, working multiple they, jobs, yep. Yeah. It's just, they can't afford the rent. Right. So when you yeah. see people living in their parents' basements, you know, maybe, maybe instead of going like, oh, why are you living in your parents' basement? Maybe ask them. Maybe talk yeah, to them. Maybe right. go, why did you have to move back in with your parents? And maybe what they will describe is a financial reality in which they are facing a ton of student debt, in which their job doesn't pay them very much, in which they've got car payments, in which they have no hope of ever buying a house. Um, because I, you know, I'm very fortunate, but like I have a law degree and I, you know, and my income is $45,000 a year, right? I, I have yeah. no hope of building up a down payment for a house. And right. I, I've got like, and I'm in like the best position of anyone. So I, we got a whole generation that's completely screwed. Right. Um, and that's why they're living with their parents. It makes right. you start to uh, gain sympathy for that guy. I remember a few <laughs> years ago who was trying to sue his parents because they tried to kick him out of the basement. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, he will need a place to live. <laughs> yeah, which actually dovetails with the other question he sent, which is what is your problem with hard work and self-responsibility? So <laughs> well, I kind of reject the, that's a kind of a loaded question, isn't it? Yeah, right, right, right. right. Well, so was the other one. I actually phrased it wrong. What, how he actually phrased the question was, how long have you lived in your parents' basement? So ah! he's presumed, yeah, he's, yeah, he's, a, <laughs> his presumptions. he's um, a wonderful guy, but he's a uh, no, hard I, work thing. Yeah. Sorry, it's just on the hard work thing. You, you, right. you know, one of the big critiques that socialists make of capitalism is that the people who work the hardest have get the least. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is the real huge injustice that you see before you is that like the people who work in the kitchens, the people who like are in windowless, you know, boiling hot spaces all day, never see their families, the people who work three jobs, um, you know, the people who work in the fields, the people who work in the slaughterhouses, uh, the people who work in the Amazon warehouses and, and walk 20 miles a day. Um, those people can barely afford their rent. What I would, I would turn around and ask, what the hell's capitalism's problem with hard work? Right. You know, why won't you reward people for working hard? Why do you reward people who, you know, why do you, why do you reward people for being lazy, right? Because capital income, income that accrues just from, or landlords, right? Sean Hannity owns like, you know, a ton of houses and he just gets paid because he owns the houses. He's not right. doing any work. He's not maintaining, he's not even like going out and fixing stuff on the properties. He just gets money because he owns a thing. Well, that's just rewarding uh, sloth. Uh, <laughs> right. It's passive income, and that's not, yeah, and that's not labor at all. And so, you know, just to channel my former self again is, uh, you know, but all those jobs you described, and I'm just being an asshole, but all those jobs you just described, they're supposed to be entry-level jobs exclusively for people who are 18 or 19. You shouldn't be working at Amazon when you're 45 or whatever, however the argument goes. And that's one I've actually heard sure commonly. That 
people who are working jobs like that where they're 45 would agree. Exactly. Right. They don't want those jobs. I kind of have a, I have a question too that I kind of wanted to add just being in the, uh, in kind of the hip hop circle and stuff like that. I kind of get a a different, I guess, set of questions a lot of times Mm. when I, when I try to talk about this, because obviously, I mean, rap is probably the most like ultra capitalist, like, like self prophesizing career industry that, that America's birthed and, you know, a lot of ways it's punk, I guess, because, you know, it came out of a culture that they weren't really supposed to succeed. And it comes from the yeah. New York City blackout and all that. But I'm kind of curious when I've tried to, like, have conversations with, with rappers and, and artists coming up, I think they kind of view it through this lens of, like, socialism isn't answering to, like, my community or the, you know, urban community that I come from and all that, which, like, I think, like, you know, I see their point to a to a thing, but I think they kind of view it as class reductionism. What would you kind well, of can I ask? That can with? I ask you what they what the, the, if what, what they would say they mean by that? Well, you know, if you ask them, well, what what are those problems? Like I like I think exactly. that for example, you know, I everyone's on board with with healthcare, for example, you know, things like that. Yeah. But but they're very quick to point out, well, you know, like the these cops are still going to be completely racist. You know, the the industry is still not going to give me as much of a of a you know record label advance as they would this white pop star that just gets signed things like that yeah well that's a problem with capitalism <laughs> right no a hundred percent but i think i think that like the their worry is like okay well you know this is more so coming from a place of like i think they're worried like how does socialism stop racism in any way which they view as like one of the biggest hurdles in their lives you know yeah, well, I mean, there are great. There have been a, a, a number of fantastic uh, socialists of color throughout uh, the history of this country and the international socialist movement. In fact, probably if you if you probably vast majority of historical socialists are not white, uh, yeah. considering how how international the socialist movement has been. Um, uh, and how most socialist governments have if probably the largest number have been in African countries. And uh, uh, so so it, it's we have a kind of distorted image in the United States because unfortunately in the United States, um, the socialist movement has had a race problem for a long time, right. um, you know, since it's, since its origins. Um, but let, let's say, okay, well, if today's socialists are very staunchly anti-racist. You see, you know, they, they obviously all of them share the, the same criticism of the police. Um, uh, I, I think that uh, I, fix radically overhauling the way we do we do policing is a, is a really important part of today's uh, socialist agenda and is the sort of thing that distinguishes in fact the socialists from the centrist liberals who go like oh no 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 we're not going to we we don't want to talk about uh, we, we we need more police not less police we need right. uh, or or we stop it like well we'll put the body cameras on them um so I, I think I think today's socialists are very attuned to those kinds of problems, and in fact, this is the exact sort of thing we want to address. But the way I, the way I tend to start with people um, who who make these sorts of things, you said, well, you, you mentioned um, the industry giving. Um, basically is basically racist right it has with the music industry been racist for a very long time which is right. um the the whole the whole 20th century american music industry was built on taking black artists convincing them to sign away their rights or you know right. not even convincing them there's no choice um right. and uh and then or having like white artists cover the record and and you mm-hmm. know make yeah. make millions of dollars um what what are people in that position they are workers they are people who deserve the full product of their of their labors they are people who are being exploited by capitalists right um they they, they and so i i mean when we talk when we talk about what would a fair record industry if you ask people okay well how should the record industry operate what, what what should it look like and you should go well, say well uh you know i i should I should get the value of what I'm producing. If I if I sell something, if I produce something that's very popular, I should I should I should get to see the reward from that. And that's the right. fundamental social they sound like Karl Marx. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. 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 Um yeah, I, I, I think that's like just a really I see it come up. We're both members of the local DSA here in Las Vegas, which, oh. by the way, you'll probably hear more of Las Vegas because it's the fastest growing chapter in the nation. Nice. Um, in the last few months, they've grown 70%. So that's- well, You've got some good labor radicalism in Las Vegas. Uh huh. Right, right. Yeah, we have a lot of, we still kind of have a strong, strong labor movement here uh, with the culinary union in particular, right. um, but there's, there's many. 
Um, but um, this is actually reminding me of one of the other, of course, big topics. We're talking about a lot about the employer-employee relationship, but of course, the second half of kind of the diagnosis of capitalism is the profit motive. And you had uh, uh, one of the best, <laughs> I mean, it was like a lightning hit me in the head when I read the chapter, yeah. your chapter on what is the, how do you describe the profit motive and the way corporations work? Of course, you used a paperclip maximizer. I wonder if you oh, can yeah. talk about that. Uh, just a little bit of your idea of like how the capitalist system um, expects corporations to work. And we've legally ingrained it in this country. But anyway, go ahead. I'll, I'll let yeah, you. This is one of the weird things. Well, uh... <laughs> You know, there are some. Uh, there is some talk of like uh, socially responsible companies, companies that uh, you know consider stakeholders and whatever, and, and right. instead of uh, uh, instead of pure profit. Um, but there is a very strong view, and this is the view of Milton Friedman, who wrote an essay called "The Social Responsibility of Business Is to Maximize Its Profits." And Milton Friedman's view, and it is a kind of a very common libertarian view, is essentially. And I've just been reviewing for the next issue of current affairs the stack of memoirs by billionaires i've got like 20 <laughs> memoirs all by billionaires and they Sounds all miserable oh it's horrible i yeah. I'm, I'm, in, I'm in deep pain yeah. but um but one of the things they all say basically is that you only make a profit by delivering the social good right because people buy stuff and if they buy stuff from you clearly they wanted the stuff which means you're delivering them something they want which means you are creating a social good through um, your seeking of uh, your own gain. So that's kind of how Milton Friedman justifies it. He says, well, a company is designed to serve the interests of its shareholders, but by serving the interests of its shareholders, it serves the interests of everyone. The problem with that, right, is that uh, it sounds very nice and it works sometimes, mm -hmm. right? You can right. you can see how it does it it does work because you think, well, I, if I want to make a pile of money, how do I make a pile of money? Oh, well, I could invent this thing and people would want the thing and then they give me money for the thing and then they get the thing they wanted and I get a pile of money. Um, but when you're thinking in Friedman's terms, which is purely like the, the maximize your profits, um, what ends up happening is you kind of go off the rails at a certain point because if it's truly maximize your profits and don't think of any other goal, then it only works to the extent that those two things are aligned, that me maximizing my profits is aligned with the social good. And there's an assumption that these two things are the same, but we have to ask if they're the same. And they're not the same. And one reason we know they're the same is we can think about um, the fossil fuel companies and climate change. Um, mm -hmm. So for ex it turns out that if you are a fossil fuel company, maximizing your profits um, means doing something and selling a product that has a giant externality that is a that has an unpriced cost in it that that is borne by society at large um well what <laughs> it, it's not just that you keep producing that thing that has the unpriced externality but if you truly care about maximizing your profits you need to lie to people you need to you need to try and get people to not notice the uh, social cost of what you're doing. You need to try and get people, because otherwise, the, if they start banning fossil fuels, right, there go, there go your profits. So that's why a lot of the oil companies launch propaganda campaigns to convince the public to doubt climate change. It's why I, I just... Um, posted an interview I did with uh, Wendell Potter, who's a former Cigna insurance executive, and he was talking about how the health insurance industry manipulates public opinion. Uh, he was in it. I mean, this is a conspiracy. He, he's literally a guy who did this. And he said, well, what, the thing is, because we're so concerned with maximizing profits, that does not only mean that we squeeze as much money as we can out of the insurance customer by de denying claims. It also means that we lobby to make sure there are no efforts to restrict the insurance industry. And it also means that we put out all these talking points lying about other countries' healthcare systems because if the public understood that you can have a better healthcare system if you take away the private insurance industry, then they would get rid of the private insurance industry and that would kill our profits. And so as a profit maximizing company, it's not a conspiracy theory. It's literally what happens when you give an institution that incentive to maximize its own good 
without considering the ultimate social good, because you assume those two things are the same. Turns out they're not the same, and that absolute disaster can ensue. Yeah, and they can't be the same, or we wouldn't need welfare. We wouldn't need, you know, any kind of, you know, any social programs at all. If 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 profit would uh, is coextensive automatically with the social good, then why are we having any of these problems? Why are there poor people? Right? <laughs> I mean, oh, because they're all lazy. Well, that's obviously yeah. just a really bankrupt view of human nature um, and ignorance of what it's like. Uh, if you, you obviously don't know any poor people. Um, and uh, that was part of what started to, my ideology to shift radically when I started getting into public defense and uh, in criminal defense mm -hmm. work is just, of course, meeting a lot of poor people. And that, yes. that, that changes things. Um, uh, so one of the examples that, that comes to mind now that I've thought about since I read your book is uh, actually this documentary that just came out on uh, the social dilemma. It's actually quite a literal uh, example is what, of course, the social media companies did, including YouTube and all these other ones, is they wrote an algorithm that is a self writing algorithm. The algorithm actually, it has a singular directive of, you know, obviously the ultimate goal is profit, but their singular directive is to try to keep people into your program as long as possible because that's how we can sell ads. It becomes, but what the algorithm also does is it improves upon itself. It learns from its environment and mm. continues to maximize its ability to do what it does, which is actually quite literally what corporate boardrooms do. And what, uh, what any, what, you know, of course, entire uh, divisions of a corporate uh, corporate structure is devoted simply to doing exactly what that algorithm does, which is just maximize profit uh, to the point of reckless abandon, right? And that's how we see all these, you know, I mean, people you think about what happened with the bank crisis and everything, and I'm not an economist, but it seems pretty clear because, you know, everything you're talking about, they were finding every cut corner they could possibly cut because that was their directive. That's what they do. If you accept the, the Milton Friedman assumption. And actually, the thing about libertarianism is that it's very, very tempting. This is why I, I try and write like as, as compellingly as possible because I understand why people believe it because it almost sounds correct. Because when you say, you know, well, people buy products and those products express their will and the corporation only sells the things that people want and it's a voluntary transaction. Um, you know, the Adam Smith thing about like self-interest creates the collective interest. It sounds persuasive. But then, and if you accept that, you have no way of critiquing what the social media companies are doing there, right? Because by definition, it's good. Right. So even though like you ask, well, what are they doing? Well, they are trying to maximize the amount of attention that you pay to their platform so they can sell ads so that those people can sell you products. You go, well, um, yeah, but it's all voluntary. Um, you're choosing and you wouldn't choose it if you didn't want it. You go, but yeah, but they, they're literally trying to manipulate, like hiring psychologists to try and manipulate you and you go yeah but it's still free choice it's still free choice and you have to ignore all the all the right. findings in mm -hmm. psychology about how we don't we actually we can be tricked and deluded um but but um yeah you don't have any way to critique that even though if you think about it rationally you say well what would a social media um platform that was designed to serve the good of its um subscribers or its users do you go, well, it would, first off, it would care a lot about the health of their social relationships. It would help care a lot about their happiness. It would care a lot. Uh, yeah, their mental health would be a huge aspect of what you would think about in designing that platform. And you would, your, your algorithms would be designed to maximize people's mental health, happiness, and well-being. Um, right. And and that's and, and and that's kind of inconceivable uh, to us almost. And one reason it's inconceivable. And there's this fantastic book by this economist Mariana Mazzucato called "The Value of Everything." And she talks about how it used to be that in economics there was a, a concept of value distinct from price. And the question was: To what extent do market prices reflect the underlying social values of things? And then the idea was that the social value was such a mushy, nebulous concept that it became, the, the easier thing to do was just to say, well, if something commands a price, that is its value. That tells us what, the, we need to ask anything else. And what that led to was everything is by, everything that happens in the market is by definition 
good and value, no matter what it is, right? So even if it involves like poisoning kids, right? Like even if it involves selling mm-hmm. opiates, like and, and, and lying about it, even if it involves lying and cheating, and even if the social the fabric is fraying, and even if everyone's unhappy and killing themselves, right? It is by, it's still by definition good because whatever the market says is, is good <laughs> right. by definition. Right, right. right. And I, I mean, I listen to that as I chug a large Burger King Coca-Cola down this entire interview. Hey, right. look, I'm eating Pringles. We all love the products of capitalism, capitalist society. How dare we, how dare we use this technology right now to discuss, uh, critiques capitalism while we're using it. But, know. Um, you know, and that's, that's actually an important point to note just for our listeners is like, you know, we're in a capitalist system, so you can't possibly <laughs> enjoy yeah. the chips. We can't possibly, um, uh, not live in society, right? <laughs> Why I is to just... Angola if you really want us to yeah. I guess, stay true to our work? I, I'm only allowed to criticize capitalism if I move to some island where there is no capitalism. Then I can criticize it, yeah. and 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 everything is socialized there. But well, um, and of course, the counterpoint is uh, uh, you know that communists could have said it. You live oh, in yeah, the Soviet right. Union, and yet you criticize it. I mean, it works <laughs> right. under any system you can yeah. imagine, right? Because yeah. by exactly. definition, the system is producing whatever the things you have are. Right. right. Say, no, say nothing about like, you know, how hard it would be to actually go make that alternative system that, in fact, we're trying to build. There's one last kind of big question um, that I have that I'd love to hear your answer to, but just the incentive. Uh, Decatur and I, well, I call him Decatur. He, he's Brent's, but Decatur is his name for his hip hop work. But um, I probably sound so lame when I talk like that <laughs> for his hip-hop his, work his but anyway work yeah <laughs> that thing he does I'm obviously not part of the hip-hop yes. community nor welcome to be part <laughs> no. of it yeah but, you, uh, just, you just blew any of the contacts you could have had yeah <laughs> I could have been famous but anyway um what was I gonna say is this idea that like well okay uh, how long is the government going to hold your hand at some point if we give yeah. you everything um where is the incentive for anyone to participate in the economy and in fact you know what where who will who would work at amazon if the alternative was i could just sit at home and enjoy my universal housing or at least my right to housing and you know you know how the argument goes so if i didn't if i had yeah. all my basic needs taken care of yeah. then why do anything well, I, I think there, there, so there are a few points. The first point is that it relies on an assumption about human beings that I think is false, which is that we enjoy not doing things. Um, I don't think people actually enjoy not doing things. I think people get bored um, and, and they, they want to be active. I think the problem is not that they don't want to do uh, work. Uh, I, I think the problem is far more that jobs suck. It's not the work. <laughs> itself yeah. sucks. I, I, I do work. I like work. It's the, the structure of uh, the, in which that work occurs, which is a job in which you're just told what to do. Um, that is deeply unpleasant. So if you had a universal basic income, the answer is, well, how would Amazon get its uh, boxes filled and packed? Well, one answer is uh, they'd have to make it They'd have to make it better to do that, right? They'd have to. Mm-hmm. They'd have to make it far more appealing, and they'd have to pay you more, and they'd have to. They'd have to offer you something. They'd have to offer you a sense of, um, you know, uh, they'd have to offer you a sense of community, right? If you mm-hmm. could go and make a lot of friends at the Amazon warehouse because you actually had time to socialize with people, and it was, then yeah. So so it's absolutely true that unless certain things were improved, people would not do them. That's part of the point. Right. <laughs> right. It, it, right. Um, but it's also the case that a lot of people talk about the incentive for innovation, right? They say, well, if, if someone couldn't reap the rewards from uh, creating something new, why would they do it? And the two answers to that, the first answer is um, it's not why people innovate um, because, uh, I, I, again, I founded a magazine. I didn't do it because I wanted any money. Uh, I did it because it's intrinsically enjoyable and I think it's valuable, which is the reason. And in fact, funny thing is reading these billionaire memoirs, all of them insist they don't do it for the money. So if you take them at their word. <laughs> I, oh, I mean, okay, good. Yeah. But, but everyone who creates something says, I did it because I enjoyed working on it. I did it because I, I wasn't, you can't, the things that are really socially valuable the people who work on those things don't do it for the money. The things that people innovate for the money are things like complex financial products, right? Um, but the, the, and, and the people, and one reason you know this is because the socially valuable innovations, those people never get any money. I, and I have this, I think I put it in the book, like Peter Thiel confessed to this, right? Where he's like, no, no, no. The way to make a bunch of money in our society is not to be an innovator. The innovators never get shit, right? You, you know, people who invent 
you, what, the, the, the Forbes billionaire list is not full of inventors, right? right? <laughs> it is full of capitalists, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. it, it, it is not full of people who, who made a thing where you're like, I love that thing. Um, for, the most, for the most part, there are a few. Well, I mean, even, I mean, I would even say, I mean, I think everyone in this world probably thanks to Joe Rogan, everyone always points to Elon Musk, who really hasn't invented anything that we've never heard of. He invented an electric car. I mean, that's not exactly... Well, even so, with a team of engineers, right? Yeah, so you, right. Yeah, it wasn't know, him on the line. In order to yeah. evaluate whether he is being rewarded in proportion to his contribution, you really have to have a better sense of, of the degree to which other people had important in, parts of, in, that, in that innovation process. Sure. Um, uh, because once you have a bunch of money, you can pay people to do your innovating for you. Um, right. and, and then you can take all the credit. Um, Much so, more efficient. <laughs> yeah. So what Peter Thiel said is the way you get rich in our economy is not through innovating, but through um, monopoly. You just find something that people really need, and then you make sure you're the person who controls it. And that's the best way. Um, it doesn't involve inventing anything. The best way to make money is like if, if everyone needs to go down this one road and you buy the patch of land and you put a gate across it and you mm -hmm. charge admission. Like right. It, Thing. You're just a rent seeker um, in, in the economic terminology. So the, the, the question to ask is, is ours a society that rewards innovation? Um, and is it rewarding the things that we want to reward people for? Or could we design it differently so that in, innovation was actually rewarded and all of these behaviors that are actually socially destructive were not rewarded? But if you look, I mean, again, if you go back to the fossil fuel companies, there you have people who are being heavily financially rewarded for something that is socially destructive. Um, so well, no, I think that's a good point because I do think that's a huge fear that, you know, people yeah. who view socialism as a dirty word, they think innovation just, the buck stops here, right? And it's just, there's, there's nothing more other than, you know, we don't get anything new and that, that's how people view socialism. So I do think it's important that there's still yeah. like an innovation value in some sense. People, the people who innovate, creative people don't think at all about money, right? Scientists, for the most part, do not think about money, right? Because they're obsessed. They're singularly obsessed with creating stuff. The process of creating, there's a reason for this. And it's not because they're selfless. It's because they're obsessed like the process right. of innovating and creating things, the kind of people who do that, they have a single-minded focus on the thing and not on anything extrinsic. They live in their heads. They don't even live in the material world. Um, so generally, I think incentives, the incentive problem is overstated. I know you've debated this a, a bit in the past about kind of like this whole right-wing populism versus oh, yeah, le yeah. le left-wing populism. And I do think it's kind of, Something that I've noticed, at least with just people I know, even, even listeners and all that, Steve, I'm sure you've noticed this too, is there seems to be a split that I think the internet's created where now that we have bypassed kind of corporate uh, media, it's everyone's either going down this, uh, you know, right wing populism, which isn't really populism, it's like Tucker Carlson and things like that, and left wing populism. Yeah. And I noticed that I, I see a, a fraction of the far left, or not even far left, but just, you know, these lefties that are kind of starting to try to communicate a deal with like the far right. And I'm, I'm wondering if there, you have any, like, I guess, ways on how to prevent that. Cause to me, it seems like there's such different, you know, movements, but I do yeah. see a lot of lefties getting sucked it's, into that. Yeah. I think uh, the first place to start is by making sure that we are clear all the time about what we are actually talking about and actually advocating. Because one of the ways in which this idea that there is a kind of right-wing populist movement that is that has a lot of stuff in common with the left has developed is because like, well, they both talk about workers. Like they both say that like inequality is bad. Right. And you say, well, okay, but it's very easy. Everyone, like, that's like saying that freedom is good, right? Is it just a shift in language what kinds of things are we actually envisioning here? Um, and when you, when you think about you know, someone like Tucker Carlson, right? You, I, I read his book and he hates Jeff Bezos and I hate Jeff Bezos. So you can think, oh, we're, we're going to be great friends. Um, he hates the liberals. I hate the liberals. Um, but then he says, and haven't you also noticed how nobody in your neighborhood looks the same as they used to? And you're like, 
what? <laughs> oh, and he's like, you know, our, just our, our culture is disappearing. Mm-hmm. And I go, is it? <laughs> yeah. It's very great. And so, you know, you have to, you have to say, well, okay, but what are you advocating here? What are you saying here? Okay. You say our culture is, it? what is that? Who are the people that you're saying look different, right? And sound different. Who are you right. talking about? What do you want to do to them um like are you saying they don't share your concern what like so so i think the real thing the real way that we can avoid accidentally buddying up with people who have noxious values is by trying to be extremely specific about what the social ills we see are and what the di- uh, what the solutions that we propose are. Yeah, I think that that's a good point. I think it's easy right now, especially to kind of get caught up in the like, how did we end up with a, with a Biden type? And we're almost like, I've seen yeah. so much rhetoric of like, we hate Biden more than we hate Trump. And I'm just like, I want people to be realistic here as much as I possible. I mean, I hate like, Joe Biden, believe me. Well, sure, no, like none that. of us. I mean, I'm never going to get a Joe Biden face tattoo. Not that I would get anyone's face tattoo. Yeah. You know, I mean, like nobody's getting a Joe Biden face tattoo. No. <laughs> I have not seen any anybody do that so far. Um, I guess just just to wrap this up, then, yeah, I, with in the darkest way possible. Do you think Trump you, or Biden is going to take it? Do you think uh, we have no. to hop on and try to get you to sponsor a citizenship in Britain? Or uh... well, uh, so <laughs> I, I try to avoid making predictions. I think. Um, I, I would say that it's all very, very uncertain. And one of the reasons it's impossible to predict anything right now is because we're at such an unprecedented political moment. Um, you know, uh, Joe Biden's leading in the national polls. It, the polls are much closer in the swing states. I don't Nevada's think- Nevada's a close one. <laughs> It's, it's a lot, it's, it's far closer than uh, a lot of the Biden people are willing to admit. Sure. Um, you know, they think Joe Biden's running away with it. He's not running away with it. And in fact, uh, you know, if the polls are off by the same amount they were in 2016, Trump will win. Um, so Trump could well win. Um, Biden could win. Uh, a lot really depends on things that it is not currently possible to know. It's not possible to know what, the, what, what people are actually going to do on election day. This is a big question mark, and we're going to find out the answer. And that, that's really scary because everyone wants an answer to the question of what's going to happen. Right. Well, unfortunately, it's an unanswerable question. It will be answered by time. Right. I, I guess that I'm just trying to figure out. I mean, either way, I'm going to be just hammered to an unhealthy amount on that first week. Yeah, the whole I think week. that's something we can predict will happen. <laughs> right. That, <laughs> With that will definitely happen. Backs. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess, you know, I just, I don't know. Every, I'm, I'm telling everyone to go vote. I have no problem voter shaming the people who stay home. I know that's kind of controversial, I guess, to some people. But. Well, I think, I think you don't, I mean, I try not to call it voter shaming, right? Because I, I think uh, it, it depends how you approach it. I think the, thing, the critique that is valid of, of what is called voter shaming is saying, well, you shouldn't tell people in a way that is just going to make them mad like if they're not going to listen to you you have to tell if you're going to critique what they are planning to do you have to do it in an empathetic way that is make going to make them less likely to do it if you just do it in a way that is like satisfying to you where you're like what the fuck are you doing why are you not voting right, right. like then it's just like for your personal catharsis rather than so i try and think how do we actually get people to listen to us <laughs> And vote. <laughs> well, uh, Nathan Robinson, it, it was such an honor to have you on. Um, oh. We're both we both read your magazine and obviously your book, which we best been- best quality of magazine, by the way, in years. I right. have to say, yeah, current yeah. affairs, the print edition is worth subscribing to. Uh, Decatur called me yesterday just to talk about the palm feel. So that's that's really what it's all about. Even if yeah, luxurious palm feel. Yeah, it really is. It really is. Yeah, is what we claim to have. So I would encourage even an, even our illiterate readers, uh, listeners, to subscribe just so you can hold it and feel it. Yeah, it's um, true. It's true. And it's um, I, I was just, just trying to find my copy, but I've lost it. Um, but uh, it's it, we, we work a lot on the design. So uh, yeah, there you go. There's the latest just, issue. Yeah, just got it um, yesterday. Yeah. You don't even have to read it. You can just look at it. It's, yeah, uh, it's, 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 it's a beautiful magazine. Yeah, it it's really fun. Is. It's high. It yeah. makes you look smart when your friends come over. It's, it's all just good. So, well, thank you so, so much for coming on. Well, thank really you for having yeah. me. This was really tremendously fun. I hope to talk to you again. 
please come back on the show. Uh, we to hope to it. keep in touch. All right. Stay well. All, All right. right. Bye, Bye now. Mm-hmm. Bye. Bye. So that was Nathan Robinson. Everyone should go pick up everything he does ever. He's very convincing, more convincing than us, which is why we had to have him on the podcast. Uh, so Steve, we, unless, we kind of- unless your finances are limited. And I think Nathan would appreciate this point and actually agree with it. Um, is that if you have limited finances, you should give it to us and not him. I'm just kidding. His book is great. <clears throat> Our podcast. No, is no, great let's, too. But let's focus on us. You're right. Guys <laughs> knock his book down. <laughs> Get it off your screen. No, I'm just kidding. No, seriously, his 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 stuff is fa- fantastic. His magazine is great, and if you even if you can't subscribe uh, to the paper edition, they have it online. Um, and so you should go to Curtain Affairs. Uh, we'll drop the link in the description, and then I'll also drop the link in the description for uh, to buy a copy of his book. Um, I do I do think it's fantastic. They have an audiobook version too. I'll put that in there. Um, and I've heard, I'm not the only one who used to be a right winger who <clears throat> on my journey over, you know, kind of started with Bernie Sanders, really making me question things. And then, you know, Nathan Robinson's book specifically being a big moment for me to kind of, um, move even further left than I used to be. Right. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, so guys, but we, we really have, we've been putting out a lot of content, more content than you guys have been used to in months. Uh, yeah. Pride, pride Steve and I on that. We've been doing a great job, honestly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, we have to thank our producer, uh, Peter Pants, as well. <laughs> that's literally, that's actually literally the only reason we've been able to he's, do this thing. It, it, he's not it, on this call, so he's not, we're not going to ever release this episode, probably. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. He, he can't, yeah, exactly. Unless he's here, we don't put anything out. But no, he's, he's been great. And so that's a huge reason we've been putting out more content. But, you know, again, this show is designed for everybody. And although, you know, you can hate the way we think about the solutions to the world, at least you're getting our perspective. And, and ultimately, our goal is to brainwash you into believing everything we believe by lying to you repeatedly Definitely. about reality. So, um, you know, one of the things that we spend a lot of time on is addressing a lot of the counter arguments for socialism, the, you know, the conventional thinking. But what, what it, I think is really important to reiterate, and maybe I, I took it for granted that it's too obvious, is like what socialism proposes is to ev- eradicate poverty and eradicate and, 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 and actually offer true freedom to people in their lives, both it, from their government, but also in their workplace, also at home, but that you actually feel like you have some agency over the course of your life, right? Like your, your uh, feeling of well, I can't leave this job because, you know, if I leave this job, I won't have an income and I can't pay my rent. And also this is how I get my health care. You know, these are the core concerns that socialism is concerned about that and other things like, you know, more modern socialists are worried about like environmentalism. And well, look at the profit motive when it runs amok, it just destroys the planet. And that's obviously unsustainable, but like, it's obviously unprofitable to try to address climate change. And so these are all, you know, if it wasn't clear enough from the interview, the benefit that socialists are trying to find what they want to do with a better society, what we want to try to, the value we want to try to, you know, spread is this idea that profit isn't the whole game, right? Profit is specifically one tool for a few very rich people to exploit. And, and it's, and it's very beneficial for a few people to, to make the entire system about profit. But if we start to expand our thinking and think like, but is profit like, Nathan Robinson was talking about is the profit, you know, maximization actually the same thing as social good. We, it's very easy to see how the answer is no. Right. And there's so many agencies we have in place to try to like curb the effects of the profit motive, like the food and drug administration. Like if we just let profit be the one thing, then like all our food would be plastic and everyone, you know, and of course the libertarian would make the argument that like, Oh no, like, you know, without, uh, you know, like a diehard libertarian would say, it, without the food and drug administration, then the, you know, you would just vote with your dollar, yeah. but we know that like poverty well, has its limits. You can, that right. only works so far. And I mean, the, the problem with that theory too, just cause I I've, you know, dealt with a lot of libertarian friends and family who have said things like that in the past. Well, the problem is like, Oh, well, once that starts happening, we'll just rule them out because we as a market will decide that we don't right. like them anymore. Well, right. you can do that, but what do you say to the person and the, and the persons that have died? Because, yeah. Right. You right. Know, How many like, people oh, don't have worry, to die? Don't, yeah. Yeah. Don't worry about your mom. She's dead because you know, like, of bad, we don't have anything to regulate that. But now I'm yeah. not going to give them any money. It's like, but you know what? Uh, you know what, Decatur? Your mom is a patriot, though, because she died for the market. 
And now the sure. market has the information that if you eat that, you die. It's like going That's back true. to like, it's like, she's like the Paul Revere of grocery stores. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, right. But I mean, but for real, like, right, we, we the, the proposition of like extremist free market is that we go back to like the hunters and gatherers time where someone had to be the first guy to try out these berries and find out if they're poisonous. Yeah. Like, can we please not do that and just have some scientists go in? And I know it's going to waste your time and it's going to waste your money, but like, it'll save fucking lives. In the, in the, and, and, and yes, it's a burden on the tax. I mean, on the, on, not on the taxpayer. Well, it is a burden on the taxpayer, but it's also a burden on the corporation. But guess what? Um, those burdens actually quite uh, are, you know, quite better than the burden of our people dying from poisonous food and whatever. Yeah. And, and that's just an example. Of course, you can talk about so many aspects of life. Um, and like, it's like, oh my God, we're, there's homeless people in the streets. What can we ever do about that? Well, if you are asking that question in the context of, well, how would it be profitable to help homeless people? Then yeah, you're going to have a really hard time answering that question. So right. the, what we're really trying to, get out here is that like of course there's a lot of common critiques of socialism that i think are unfounded but also what socialism does that genuinely no other viable economic system to me is actually meaningfully offering solutions for is what about the fact that there's other social values than profit like there are things right. that are inherently contradictory with profit or at least not always coincide with profit and we need right. to we need to start thinking outside of the box you know and uh and, and, and thinking about a system that doesn't just place, doesn't worship profit as, you know, the only way our system can possibly run. Right. It, it, it's kind of funny because it's, it's juvenile in a sense, right, to have to explain to people in modern politics, you know, money isn't everything. But it, it really right. is where we're at in a society right now. Yes. And, and the fact is, which is another thing Nathan points out a lot, which is really well, is like, there's so much more to life than just profit. And we need to be, if anything, exploiting that, not fucking exploiting the hard work that people do for low wages. Right. I mean, you know, when we think about this, like, oh, it's all about hard work and self-determination. But, um, you know, I think Nathan did a good job already debunking that concept. But, um, but also that is not all life is always what life has always been about for all of human history. I mean, there, we, there's some research about hunter gatherer humans that did not work 40 hours a week. I mean, we're not really designed to churn out profit for someone else constantly. That's not really what human life is about. That's not why I think I'm on earth. And I, I, I imagine anyone listening to this thinks like, yeah, actually I, I don't think that's why I was born. If there is a why, right. You might be atheist and, or, or even if you're atheist, that doesn't necessarily um, have anything to do with your, idea of fate but you know my point is is that there might be some people who are kind of more nihilistic about the purpose of life but still would share my ideology that like i do believe my life can and should be worth more than being a profit source for someone else sure. um you know so we i mean we can talk all about the theories of socialism but i think this is a great place to start um you know and you, and you just have to realize like what we're talking about here when we're talking about like oh, well, I'm so lucky to, you know, that Jeff Bezos gave me a job that I otherwise wouldn't have gotten. But the, right. what we're asking you to question, what Karl Marx actually, you know, even if you don't call yourself a Marxist, then this is a starting point for uh, where Karl Marx was starting to ask. One of his questions was, yeah, but when you look at the way the employer-employee relationship works, there's this concept called surplus. And surplus is the difference between what you're paid and how much money you're making your boss. So obviously, if you're working in a factory, the only reason your boss is paying you at all is because he knows that it makes him more money to have you in that factory than it costs him. So he's not benevolent or she is not benevolent whatsoever. And, you know, and, and I do apologize for the gender assumption there, but we all know that there's a patriarchy that it's disproportionately men in management, um, which is why I said that. But, um, but of course there are female managers and there should be more. But the point is, is that the, there's this surplus. They're getting so much out of it. The question is how much should they? And is this the only way, like, is it actually necessary that they should be allowed to extract as much as humanly possible? And you're, you should only be allowed to make what you are willing to accept, the minimum you're willing to accept for your salary, um, where the alternative is like desperation and poverty, right? right. Like that's the system we have. It's like work or die. And, and so like, that's the way we've structured it now. Is that necessary? And is that the best system? And for hundreds of years, people have been already saying, of course, that's not the best system, but 
it's a system we're in right now. It's in a lot of ways similar to feudalism where there was a lord of, of a castle and you kind of worked in the little neighboring neighborhood around and you basically gave all your shit to him and you got to keep a little bit of it for yourself. Well, and that's quite literally what we're doing now in our workplace. You know, it's funny too, just real quick. Uh, I watched uh, something I've been doing to kind of de-stress myself through this pandemic in the past few weeks. Is it, a, is it PG? Yes. Yes. It's PG. Okay. I just wanted to brace myself. Uh, <laughs> Go ahead. There's a lot of not PG. I've been trying different vibrators okay. and I have a separate podcast. Okay, that's about what I did. <laughs> all right, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> it's Go called ahead. Buzzing with Brent. No, I think <laughs> that... <laughs> <laughs> no. Yes. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. What uh, me and my girlfriend have been doing is watching Christmas movies. Uh, <laughs> okay. And the one of them is this Netflix trilogy, which is atrocious, but everyone should watch. It's called The Christmas Bride, and it's this journalist who goes undercover as the tutor in like some fucking foreign country called Aldovia. And they have a king still. Like it's, it's still just straight monarchy and everyone just donates to the king. And, yeah, and sure. like Netflix doesn't address this once. And it's so funny <laughs> to me. And it's just like they live in this fucking straight up monarchy. Yeah. And not once is it questioned by any American, any Aldovian, nothing. It's just, sorry, it's kind of a tangent. But, I but that's actually a really interesting point. Um, to bring up is like, it does make me think of like when people used to live in a, when, when monarchy was the status quo in the world, th imagine if, if you tried to propose capitalism and democracy, right? Right. Not, yeah, not necessarily the same thing, by the way. Right. And you know what one person might've said, give me one example where that's ever worked. Right? <laughs> give me one example. Oh, where third cousin from King Charles couldn't have solved something. Yeah. Okay, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. But, but, but I mean, quite literally they would bring up Greece and Rome as their examples of like, well, people have tried democracy and it failed. So you're a moron for winning that. And then also, you know, you're, you're foolish for proposing capitalism. Like, what is that? You know, it, right. it's kind of popped up at random places during feudal times and then, and kind of died out. And it's, it, it wasn't like a steady stream from like feudalism to capitalism. There was, there was false starts and there would have been times where it would have been a very valid critique to say, um, of course, both capitalism and democracy are foolish because it's been tried and failed. And that's literally what people are saying about socialism now. And I understand for those who are saying, I genuinely think it can't work because people have tried it, whatever it is, which as Nathan Robinson pointed out, there's different types of socialism and different ways of thinking about it. Right. And uh, there have been forms of it that we might not all buy into, but there's also forms of it that, um, that, you know, have been more successful and that there's right. been foreign interference with it. I mean, you could go on and on, but it, I mean, what I'm basically saying is every time there's been a major shift in economic and political systems, there was always the time before that when people were saying that would never work. Right. right. And so like that, that might just be where we're at now. Right. This is a concept that we're talking about more is I'm less worried about the label of like socialism, democratic socialism, libertarian, whatever, and more worried about like what comes after capitalism because this sucks. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think, yeah, we can argue all day what something didn't work in what country. And the fact is, I think that anyone should at least have the, you know, emotional and intellectual honesty to say, well, what, what's working right now is nothing and we need to fix the system. Yeah. And, right. you know, even at its worst in other things, I think we would still feel the same, if not better in a different system. So let's, let's at least look at some other options here. Yeah. Um, so we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. We're back from our break. Uh, and then Decatur, is going to mansplain to you why socialism is the best. <laughs> well, no, I, I just, you know, I, you know, coming from someone who has been homeless and has been in, you know, section eight housing and things like that, you know, I, I think that it's, it's kind of sad in this country that the propaganda has worked, that socialism just makes everyone poor. Right. When really the, the whole point of socialism is to to work for the impoverished and the working class and that's how socialism has gotten big even even at its worst core right the, the whole point was to get the impoverished out of poverty as opposed to putting more people in it now whether or not you think that that worked or that didn't work the the fact is you know what it's striving for is a better society for the people at the bottom and i think that's really important to point out so i do think in america that we've we've definitely kind of suck these people into believing that we need capitalism to to rise above and that's the only thing well really 
you know, as someone who's hit low points of their life and had to, you know, pull himself up by the, by the bootstraps, well, it sure would have been a lot fucking easier with some help out of other things. And you can say, yeah, well, you know, like, look like someone like you, you, you got out of it type thing. Well, the fact is like, there was a lot of ramen stolen from Albertsons and a lot of free water from Starbucks when they still did it. And I, I think kind of my, my point is here is that, you know, if we had, you know, universal, uh, housing and not like, not like public housing, cause public housing has obviously been, you know, incredibly racialized in this country and, you know, not, not kept up with on purpose. And there's actually a really good documentary, I'm blanking on the name, but if you go on Netflix and just we'll, search, put, the, we'll put it in the description, we'll put it in. There's a, uh, about the whole projects in St. Louis that happened where we're supposed to be this, you know, utopian society. And it worked out real great until it was attacked and politicized and all that about, you know, oh, they're poor. They don't deserve these, these nice things. You know, these are, these are problems. And I, I think every time we look at the good that socialism has done, any social services we have, the only reason that they're viewed in any sort of bad light is corporations and, you know, politicians who are in the pockets of corporations to say that you don't want this, you know, you don't like this, this is bad for you. And really like the social safety nets and services that we have, have been great for the most part. So I, I just do think that's something to think about when people think that socialism is just making everyone poor. It's really the contrary where there's these, safety nets and social services that could be so much better if we took capitalism out of the the equation and just let them flourish naturally right i mean everyone's everyone's classic argument is oh you just want to turn us into venezuela which used to be a prosperous country and then socialism came along and now everyone's miserable and they're under the thumb of an authoritarian government right. and it has and nothing to do by the way that america's you know banana republic the shit out of south america right. and all, all those sorts of things well yeah exactly we've been engaged in regime change so i i i want to dodge that conversation a little bit by saying there is a huge debate about why Venezuela is in the situation it's in and, 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 and what economic choices they made, but also what interference from foreign governments like the United States have caused them to be in the situation that they're in, right? The United States is the richest nation in the history of the earth, um, it, but it's not actually being held by the people in the bottom, the bottom 99%. It's this top 1% that has all this wealth. And is that objectively better than something like Denmark, where they have a lot more, uh, you know, people who are not like upper class actually still have pretty decent lives. Right. You know? right. And, and I mean, just, just on even a more, you know, basic, less political level. I mean, the fact is we have enough food, enough resources to eradicate a lot of things in this world and we're just not doing it. And we could do it. And we look at other countries and they're doing it a hell of a lot better. And they might not be full socialist, but they're way closer to the socialist line than we are. So we at least got to ask ourselves if they can have nicer things, so to speak, why can't we? Yeah, I think that that actually gets to the core of this debate. Like that is something we actually talked about in episode one of our podcast, which of course it started right at the beginning of the coronavirus shutdown. So that was of course what we talked about. And our fundamental question was, well, we do have enough to weather this storm for everybody, but the way we've set up our economy and our society is that not everyone has access to that stuff. And right. so, it, well, we're right now in a situation where pure capitalism can't work because right. people literally can't go to work so, and do their jobs, so to speak. And so what what do we want in a situation like that? And like we said in episode one and in the interview with Nathan Robinson is this has actually always been true. It's just always been a smaller population and oftentimes a population that doesn't have the same skin color as you. So you don't actually relate to them as much. So that's what the fundamental flaw in capitalism is, is that like the, 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 the powerful people are very good at making you not think about how the fact is so many people actually can't participate in capitalism the way you and I can. And so, but we, but we easily still could, make sure that they're not like suffering and on the streets. And these are things we're capable of doing. Okay. So the question I guess is how do we distribute this stuff? So like we don't have poverty. And I mean, if that's your, if you agree with that goal, I hope you do. But if you agree with the goal, like how can we, if, if we don't need to have prop poverty, then how do we get all this stuff distributed in a way that's, that takes care of it. And the, the um, answer that most, you know, kind of more hardcore libertarians would give is that, well, you really can't because you need the profit motive to drive the desire to work and to do anything valuable in society. As soon as you take away the profit motive, then yeah, you could distribute the few resources we right now have and, or even the, the many resources we right now have. But as Margaret Thatcher said, eventually the problem, the trouble with socialism is eventually you run out of other people's money. So that's yeah. the argument that people make against socialism. But the problem is, is like, 
No socialist is talking about a society where no one is incentivized to work. We're talking right. about a society where the incentive isn't work or die or, yeah, work, I think, or be on the streets. We're right. talking about different incentives. But, I, but by my suggestion to all my libertarian friends is if your real goal, if what you really want is freedom, what I think, the reason I would call myself a democratic socialist and no longer a libertarian is that I don't just believe in the theory of freedom and I don't just believe in freedom from my government. I believe in actual tangible freedom in practice where I actually can live my life the way I want to live it and not be limited by someone else's prescription of like, what do I need to do to be profitable for them? You know, like I want to actually have a good life where I'm not trying to confide like a good life, but as long as you play the game that other people are making you play, right? Like that's, that's the fundamental question Definitely. that socialists ask is, is that really the best we can do. And I, I reject it. I don't think this is the best we can do. And I don't think this is the end of human history. Well, it's all just going to allow capitalism to destroy everything. I'll tell you why it's not the best we can do. Because first off, there's other countries that are doing capitalism better than us. Right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, I mean, there's at least more wiggle room from where we are right now for what the best we can do is. And yes, normally it seems to be the things that stay in history the longest is when conservatives fail and we get a socialist policy. It's just like this preconceived notion that this is the best we can do. It's a myth that really, really rich people want you to believe because it makes them right. a lot of money as long as you keep Voting. Yeah, I always I always look at it like, you know, that meme of, you know, there's the guy who's thinking and then the next one, it's like his mind's expanding. And then one more, his like mind's just like glowing. Into <laughs> yeah, the universe. Yeah, yeah. I always look at libertarians like that, where it's like, all right, they're out of like, you know, neoliberal is just like, I'm thinking, you know, like, here's some reform. And then yeah. like libertarians, it's like, oh, I get it. Like, they're keeping us in this box. And then to yeah. me, it's like socialism. It's like, yes, but the boxes you thought libertarians know, it's the wrong box. It's this one. And then your mind explodes. Yeah. And I'm I mean, I mean, that's where people go. Anyway, we hope that this was super, you know, a good introduction to uh, another way of thinking. And that, you know, again, our ultimate goal is to brainwash you into believing our way so we can have our way and right. then actually install an authoritarian government and impose our view on you forcibly. So that's really what we're going for. And uh, <laughs> obviously I'm kidding. So anyway, thank you so much. This was so awesome to have Nathan Robinson on. Nathan, if you end up seeing this episode, thank you so much. It was such a pleasure to have you on. So we have an episode, uh, you know, mental health episode, Star Wars bonus episode on our Patreon, which is an exclusive, which you could get for the low price of $1. $1 a month. That's, I mean, if... If you're going by the euro, that like that's even less, really. Like you know, that's less than whatever equivalent to one dollar is for you, essentially. I mean, if you're in America. That's a hundred <laughs> cents. Let's talk about how low how low is the dollar? You could actually find one dollar a month on the street. Like if you set your mind to it, you could find a dollar every month, and right. that's it. That'll pay for the show itself. But we're putting that's out bonus it. content. Yep. Do you want this little dog to starve? Oh, that is the cutest dog. What kind of dog is that? Um, she's a rescue, so I have no idea. Doesn't matter. Doesn't, doesn't matter. matter. Cute. Doesn't matter. Cute. The cute the, kind. Doesn't matter because we're focusing on me right now, okay? <laughs> you bring her on the show. <laughs> right. That was my fault. Yeah. So, yeah, we got, we got a lot of episodes coming out. We're going to be doing an election night special. We just heard Nathan didn't want to answer, all right? I feel like it's going to be a trend where I want everyone you. to just give me an answer, and no yeah. one wants to answer who's going to win. We're going to ask everybody. Like, yeah, we're going to ask everyone. Ask everyone. That's, <laughs> that's definitely a thing. I want to, yes. Yeah. I just want to say, I just want to, like, before we move off the topic of socialism and, and, and conclude this episode, you know, thank you for everyone for listening. If you still have questions and you're not completely brainwashed by our ideology yet, we really do encourage you all to write into us and ask us to address more topics, you know, right. to, to talk about this stuff more. Our goal is to make this a conversation that actually is not just for people who already think like us, but instead to actually try to, you know, explain to people why with a straight face would someone call themselves a socialist? Like, are you, right. you know, like my one friend said, how long have you lived in your parents' basement? You know, how, how ignorant and dumb yeah. are you if you would say that? You know, how, don't you know that socialism is never which, or whatever, you know? Which, by the way, as someone who was homeless once, uh, I take offense to that because especially I would have lived in someone's basement, but Las Vegas doesn't have basements. 
All right. Exactly. So exactly. Doesn't even doesn't even make sense. Yeah, we it's it's actually kind of sad. I I, I kind of like the idea of a ba- of a basement, but yes. Please keep sticking with us, and thank you guys for keep listening because I can speak for Steve and I both that we didn't think anyone would be still be listening to this podcast after we took such a long break. Yeah, yeah. No, that's really cool. So thank you very much. All right. Well, everybody, um, be good, be safe, and give us all your money on our Patreon. Okay. See you later. <laughs>